code can be many things. It can be beautiful, modern, elegant. But it can also be other things. It can also be legacy, complex, and sometimes even a little mysterious. Who, who is working on a code base at work which is rather legacy, complex, and sometimes a little mysterious? Wow, that's virtually every hand rising. Great, you're in the right talk. This is um, what we're going to talk about. What we're going to talk about today. So, um, we're going to talk about how to understand existing code. Because existing code is what we get to work with, right? And we're going to talk about how to understand existing code that doesn't want you to understand it. By the way, for those of you that I don't know, my name is Jonathan. Um, I blog on Fluent C++ quite often, and I wrote the book, The Legacy Code Programmer's Toolbox, which is about how to be happy and efficient with legacy code, and I work at Murex. The 10 techniques we're going to talk about to understand existing code um, are my favorite 10, which means that they're not the only 10 in the world. Um, maybe you know some of them, Maybe you'll discover some of them. Um, there are some of them that people tend to acquire with experience. Um, the purpose of this talk is to uh, make you uh, acquire them without waiting anymore. We're going to proceed in three steps. The first step, um, we're going to explore techniques to have a broad overview of our code base, locating stuff, that kind of thing. In the second part, we're going to see how to make sense of code pretty quickly, becoming a speed reader of code. And in the last step, we're going to see three techniques to understand code in the small details whenever we need to do that, even though we don't need to do that all the time. All right, let's start. Um, good place to start is technique number one which is know your I.O. frameworks. Know your I.O. frameworks. What does that mean? Well, let's see an example. So we've got this app with an inviting compute button and a text field next to it. Um, so the user brings the mouse over compute, clicks on compute, that's some calculation going on, and the answer is 42. I didn't say what the question was, but the answer is 42. Now, this animation went very quickly. Let's see it again in slow motion. One more time. So the user brings the mouse over the button, clicks on it, and then something happens. We get to the code. When I click on the clicking on the button, we traversed a purple wormhole that drove us straight to the code, the code that corresponds to that button. So, so we clicked on the button. There was the purple wormhole that drove us in a blink of an eye to the code that corresponds to that button. And then this code does something, produces a42, the 42 gets pulled back to the UI and get displayed, and that's what happened behind the scenes. The purple wormhole, in this case, is the UI framework. This is not rocket science. If you have a UI framework, you know, you know what that is. But the point here is to know the code of your UI framework. You don't need to know all of it but enough to find your way around. So in practice, this technique number one consists in blocking off a few hours just once and starting from the click of the button and following everything that happens all the way to the business code. Trying to find your way around so that next time when you want to find the code that corresponds to something in the UI, you can do that in the blink of an eye, just like the purple wormhole. This technique, I think it saved me like hundreds of hours, literally. 
Now, let's assume that you can travel in the purple wormhole. What are, what are you going to look for? What code are you going to look for? An example of interesting code to look for is technique um, number two, which we'll see in a moment. I uh, just want to make a point that the UI framework is not the general case. It's just a specific case, uh, but it can be um, something that doesn't have UI, but the interface is more like a REST handler, or the interface is logs, what we see, um, or unit tests. Um, but the point is that it's something that we developers, as humans, we see. Assuming that developers are humans, but this is a completely different debate I'm not getting into. Um, and the UI framework, this purple wormhole, allows us to go to the corresponding code. And this is something we need to um, be able to travel in. Now, what are we going to, to look for? A good thing to look for is a stronghold. So I learned the word uh, stronghold in Game of Thrones. In Game of Thrones, a stronghold is a small castle where a family lives. And that's their base, that's the place, their safe place, no, they, the place they know perfectly well. And they start from that place and explore the world or conquer or make alliances or whatever they do in Game of Thrones. But the, the base is a stronghold. Now, do you remember those games we used to play when we were kids, at least when I was a kid? Um, um, those strategy games where you start with a base and the rest is a fog of war, be like Age of Empire, right? Heroes of Might and Magic. Um, so you start with a stronghold, a little castle, and you explore the world around. And the more you explore, the more you unveil of that fog of war. Now, what does this have to do with the code base? In this analogy, the world map is the code base. And the stronghold is a piece of code in that vast code base that you understand perfectly well. It doesn't have to be big. It can be just one line of code. But the thing is, just like when you are in your castle in, in, in that game, you can explore the world around it and, and, and invade that fog of war. If you, if you understand perfectly one line of code or, or, or one chunk of code, chances are you can, understand, you can also understand the lines that are just after and just before it. And then you know two more lines and you've, you've uh, augmented the part of the code you're familiar with. And then you can work your way out from this place and explore more and more of the code. Now, what makes a good stronghold? Um, let's get an example. This is one stronghold I've used in a code base I've been working with. It's a linear interpolation. I'm assuming that everyone knows what a linear interpolation is. Um, this is basic math. This is something I'm familiar with, I'm okay with, and I, that I understand from a functional point of, point of view. If you can find where in the code base this happens, then th there is one place in the code base that you understand perfectly well. And then you can look around and, and you can relate what's around it with that bit you understand well. So in the map analogy, this would be a stronghold. And then we could explore the world uh, starting from it. Now, what makes a good stronghold? Um, a good stronghold is uh, something that you can map to something you understand in the application. Now, working with stronghold um, allows to discover the code bit by bit. But it's a bit, um, it's a bit of a local analysis to go faster and uncover more of the code, we can use technique number three, which is using call stacks. The, the point of call stacks from um, um, an, an instructive perspective is that they can show modules. 
and they can show how modules interact together. They, they give a screenshot of several modules interacting together. So in our map, um, a core stack would look like that, spanning across several countries and showing the borders between those countries. Now, there are other possible stacks in the code base, like this one, for example. And, and the one on the left is a good core stack. The one on the right is not such an interesting core stack. Because the one on the left shows several countries and shows how they relate to each other, and the one on the right doesn't show anything. So, so what makes a good core stack, what makes an instructive core stack? Um, well, there are two things, I think. The first one is it has to be deep, because the deeper, the more it shows, obviously. And more interestingly, it has to show a common use case of the application, which ties back to the idea of a stronghold. So like on the map, a stronghold is a great place to look um, for, core, for, for core stacks. Now, imagine you, you don't know anything about a code base, like you're starting a new project or you're joining a new team or whatever, and you don't know anything. How do you find a, code, a, a, a stronghold? How do you find a stack? Well, the, probably the easiest way is to ask somebody. Now, there are horror stories where developers don't have anyone to ask. I, um, at home, I organize a meetup about software craftsmanship, and sometimes we, we share stories, and there's, um, there are some horror stories, really. And in some cases, people have no one to ask because no one is working on the project anymore, and they get assigned to it. So, so sometimes you just can't ask your dev lead. So in that case, you can ask um, people that use the application. If you have like, business people in the company to do that, that's great. Or you can ask users directly. But ask them what's a common use case, what they like to do with the application. And then you can locate that on the UI or whatever interface you have. Go through the purple wormhole, which will drive you right to the stronghold. And then you can look at the stacks. You can also uh, look at flame graphs, which um, give a view of several core stacks at the same time. That wraps up the first part about having a global overview of the code base. Knowing your IO frameworks, finding a stronghold, or several strongholds, and exploring the world around them, and analyzing core stacks. We're now moving on to the second part, which is making sense of code really quickly. So the concept of being a speed reader um, hasn't started with code, right? It has started with books. So there's um, an analogy about uh, w between reading a book and reading code, I think. There are several things we can um, find in common about quickly reading a book and quickly reading a piece of code. To find um, information about that, there's this book that has been a um, bestseller since 100 years ago when it came out. It's called How to Read a Book, and it's about how to read the book, essentially, um, about nonfiction books. And it does a lot of things um, about how you should approach reading a nonfiction book to get the most information out of it in um, the least amount of time possible. So pl plenty of things in that book. There are a few things, a few principles we can draw from it and apply to reading code. One of them is to not read a nonfiction book cover to cover. Now, I make the assumption that code is like nonfiction book. Now, if you are reading code, um, by a fireplace, in a winter evening, in a comfortable armchair, um, then perhaps that looks like a fiction book. But when you're at work, you want to go as fast as possible, right? So we don't, we don't read code cover to cover or 
more exactly, we don't read code line by line for a start. Then, in a nonfiction book, the goal is not to understand everything. And in code, I think that's the same. There is so much code to understand. Um, in any company, there's, there are thousands, or sometimes hundreds of thousands, or millions of lines of code. And you don't want to read everything, because it's going to take several lifetimes to do that. So it's OK. We don't, know, we don't need to understand everything of a piece of code to make sense of it. And the third principle is to focus, to, to look at places where the information is located. Because the information is not located um, in a uniform manner across, across a code base or across any piece of code, as we all see. The next four techniques derive from those principles and show how to implement them in practice with code. Technique number four is, is to start reading from the end. It turns out that in a book, the information tends to be um, concentrated at the beginning and at the end of the book, of the chapter, of the paragraph, of any unit in a book. In codes, there tends to be that pattern as well. The beginning of, say, a function, for example, the beginning of a function is a prototype. Reading a prototype is quite a natural thing to do, to understand what a function is doing. Now, what's less natural is to read the end of a function. Now, now what's the end of a function? Yeah, that can be a return statement. Let, let's see an example. So this is a piece of code um, coming out of an open source project on the internet. The goal is not to pick on that particular project. It's just code to support the examples. We're going to see several examples of open source codes to illustrate the techniques. We're going to go quickly over them just to uh, focus on, on the particular techniques. And at the end, we'll go into more details of one particular piece of code to assemble all the techniques together. So now let's start by looking at the end of the function. The, the, the end of the function is a return statement, return alignment. We don't know what alignment means, but it must be something very important in that function. Because the whole purpose in life of that function is to return alignments. Right? So we now have this crucial piece of information that will help you during the analysis of that function. It returns alignments. Now, if we um, look at alignments, they seem to be filled with blocks. So blocks must be important as well. Block come from reader. Reader come from IS. With this quick analysis, we now have a vague structure of the second half of the function. We're going to stop here on that, on that particular example, and we'll come back on that technique in the final example where we see all the techniques together. Now, the end of the function is, is, it can be the last lines, but it doesn't have to be. In the more general sense, the end, the goal of a function is more its outputs, because a function is made to produce outputs. Now, the outputs of the function can have several, several forms. One is a return statement, right? But there can be also other forms, uh, for example, a uh, non-const reference that we pass in and the function is supposed to fill, right? Or a data member, if it's the member function we're talking about. Or I-O, or more O in that case, but like making something in the UI or something. Or uh, changing a global variable. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it happens then. If it does, it counts as an output. Or, and... I apologize in advance for what's going to be displayed. If you're a sensitive person, I advise you to look away. That's not, I'm not saying it's good. It, it, it counts as an output. Now, can we, can we find all the outputs 100% of the time? No. When it's a return value at the end, it's obvious. Uh, when it's a global variable, it's less obvious, obviously. Um, but most of the time, we can find 
most of them. And since the function is made for producing those outputs, most the bulk of the function is supposed to be um, oriented towards producing those outputs. So the outputs should be most of the time towards the end, which is why reading from the end um, is a good place to start. Another place that contains information in a function is, or any piece of code for that matter, is the frequently occurring words. Let's take an example. Um, this is code coming out of an other open source project. It's too big to fit on a slide. I mean, it fits on a slide, but we can't read it. But that's okay, because we don't read code line by line. Now, we are going to make a, an analysis of that code to count every occurrence of every term in that function. That gives us that. <coughs> that. The term that occurs the most frequently is len, occurring 20 times, and then it, the second one is value, occurring 17 times, and so on. The table is truncated, and it's, it, go, it goes all the way down um, with many terms occurring just once or twice. But we're only interested in the terms um, appearing often, because if, uh, if something is appearing often, that it must be important, right? The, must, the function must somehow be about it. And if we can immediately get that view, we can have a, an idea of what the function is about, right? So in this particular case, one example that um, works well in that function is, is value. I'm going to highlight every occurrence of value in that code. It's in orange. What we can see is that value is about everywhere in the function, right? So it must be really important in that function. If you compare this approach versus reading the code line by line to get, get a feeling that value is going to be important, you need to read like half of the function or two thirds of the function. Whereas with this kind of analysis, we get immediately um, this information. Now we can also uh, find patterns sometimes. Like in this case, for example, that these two, um, two words, rec key and vol name, that are in the top six, seven of the word counts, and they happen to be the parameters. And we highlight them, they happen to be always used together, right? In, in an expression that seems to be um, the same all the time. In this particular case, particular case, we are going to look at this particular expression, but this is a pattern. And if there's a pattern, it means that those two terms, those two inputs work together, and that tells us something about them. And then that can even suggest some refactoring. Perhaps we could grip them together in, in an object. Perhaps they relate together so much that they belong to an object. But the purpose of today is not refactoring, it's understanding. Now, that's not to say that inputs are always um, intensively represented, like in, in this example, um, the input is used only once. It's just to show that inputs are all, all the time, they're not all the time um, frequently appearing in a function. Looking at the, um, the word count can also show patterns. For example, in this word count, there are two additional columns. So the first and the second column are the same as before. It's the name of the term and the number of, of occurrences. The third column is the span. The span being um, the distance between the first line and the last line where this, this term appears. But the span doesn't say much if we don't compare it to the total size of the function. So the fourth column is the proportion, which is the span over the size of the function. Now, in this, in this uh, word count, there's uh, something that stands out. There's one of those words that stand out when we look at the proportion and the number of occurrences. Can you see that? Can you see which one it is? I think I heard it. That's token. Token is amongst the top three of the word of the function, but its proportion is much smaller 
than the others. Right? That means that token is used a lot in a local part of the code. If we highlight token, that's what we see. So the first bit of the function is, is uh, about token, probably. Um, perhaps it reads token, perhaps it writes into token. Um, but the thing is, this, is, this looks like a unit. This looks like a responsibility of a function that's mostly worried about using token, right? And knowing that, you can identify that this block is one responsibility, and perhaps also uh, factor it out into a separate function if you want to refactor it with that kind of code. Now, to make that kind of word count, um, we have several tools at our disposal. The first one is our eyes. Right, if you, if you have just um, a few lines of code, uh, you can look at them and, and see which words seem to be most, mostly, uh, mostly present in that piece of code. But when it's bigger than a few lines of code, it, it's a bit of a pain, right? So we can use um, search highlighting. Like you click on a word and you highlight every other word in that code. For example, in Vim, use star. Yeah, I'm a Vim person. Sorry. Um, and if it's bigger than that, if it's like a 1009 1, function, for example, you can't really have a, an overview of that function, then you can use a tool. I didn't find any tool to do that, so I made one. Um, it's available on fluentcpp.com, so it's fluentcpp.com slash word dot count. Feel free to use it, you just paste your code in press run, and you get, you get the kind of word count we've just seen. Now, there are several ways to count words. The first one is to count words, basically. Um, another one is to split the words inside of a camel, camel case symbol, and in, in case there are several, several times the same concept that's repeated uh, in several camel case symbols, um, and you can also be sensitive to case or not, obviously. We've seen how to count the word of a function, but it can be useful to count the word of a bigger, a bigger chunk of code, like a file, for example. Like, imagine you've got a file with a name, um, with only consonants, for example, .cpp, and you have no idea what that file is about. It's 20,000 lines long, and you'd like to know what it is about but approximately. If you run a word count on that kind of code, you get the most important players in that file, and that can tell you a bit what this file is about. This is really useful. And you can also do that for several set of files. And if anything, that can bring up questions, like, for example, oh, I see that term coming up all the time in the code base. What is it, for example, for a person joining the team? Right, another place that contains information is control flow. So going back to the book analogy, what you want to do when you start a nonfiction book is to um, read very carefully the table of contents because it tells you what you're going to find in that book. It doesn't tell you the detail, it tells you the topics that are going to be in that book. It would be awesome if we could have a table of contents of a piece of code, right? Well, the lines that have control flow, control flow being if, else, for all these guys, they, get, they give an approximation of a table of contents, right? Because they, they, they hold the structure of, of the function, so they, they have major steps. That doesn't, they don't tell you what's done inside of that step, or those steps, but they're going to tell you a glimpse of, of the topics tackled in that function. Let's see an example. Again, a piece of code that's too big to fit on the slide. Let's run a filter on that code to remove the lines that can, uh, to remove, yeah, to remove all the lines that don't contain a control flow keyword. This is uh, how you do that with Vim. I'm sure you can do that with other IDs as well. 
And that's the result. And in this particular case, it's unreadable. And it's an example I've, I've chosen on purpose because sometimes it's, it's readable, you can, see, you can see all the topics of the function, but sometimes you can't, like in this case. Now, this is still code, which means that we can apply the other techniques, in particular, the word count. So we can make a word count on that code and see that, for example, the one that appears the most frequently is C setting. And if we look at how C setting is used, it's used all, always with the same pattern compared to a type. So this code, the structure of this code is to check a setting and, and in particular the type of a setting and um, doing something accordingly inside of the if statements. Same thing, if you'd like a way to do that um, and you don't have Vim at home, you can use this online tool that you paste your code in and it, 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 it removes the line that don't, don't contain the control fleet filter, the control flow words. Right, now last technique of the speed reading techniques, it's to scan for the main action. So there's this rule that seems to govern nature and programming and everything, um, it's the 80-20 rule. And some people even go as far as saying it's the 90-10 rule, which says that 10% of the causes are responsible for 90% of the consequences. We use that for performance in general, like 10% of the execution time is spent in 90% of the, of the codes. Doesn't sound right. Yeah. You, I'm not going to try. Yeah, you, you, you got it, yeah? <laughs> well, the point is, I think we, we can use that um, when we read code, not about execution time, but about meaning. There are plenty of lines of code that we don't care about. I mean, they have to be there because the code wouldn't compile and perhaps there are some corner cases to deal with. But if you want to get the general sense of a function, you don't care about most lines of code. So this technique consists in scanning a code, looking for the main actions. Main action is the lines that do have a lot of meaning. Now, the goal is to go fast. We don't read code line by line, uh, but the the purpose here is to just scan the codes and decide whether a given line is the main action or not. And if it's not the main action, we don't, we don't even read it, we move on. And it's, it's okay if we don't get every line right and if we miss some line, because we, we can always go back and the idea is to have a general view and not a very accurate view. Now, how do we do? Like, if we, if we have one uh, particular line, how, we, how do we determine, how, how we do, do we tell if it's the main action or not? Well, things that are typically not the main action are intermediary variables or special cases, error cases. I mean, error handling is tremendously important, but when you want to get the general meaning of a function, you don't care about it. Um, Things that's complicated. I mean, if it's 90 10, then if there's something that looks complicated, it has a 90% chance of not being important, so you can just move on. Right, we're going to see an example. This is the moment where we see an example that combines all of the speed reading techniques. But this is code coming out of an open source repo. Um, we don't know anything about it, and we're going to try and, and make sense of that code. So the first of the four techniques of speed reading was to start reading from the end. So let's look at the end of, of that function. And it mentions positions. There's a sort of positions. And the line before it is a transform that fills positions. So positions seems to be one of the goals of the function. Filling position seems to be one of its goals. Right. Now, next to it, there's insertion map seems to be also one of the big players of the function. If we, if we go up a little, we can, um, we can see that um, position and insertion map uh, continue to appear. So they seem to be like the important players, and the function seems to be oriented towards building them. 
bright. Now, let's make a word count. In the word count, we see that it can take the, the top 10 words include insertion map and positions, which confirms what we've guessed in the first, uh, by, by looking at the end of the function. But there's also CHR, which is at the very top. Right? If we highlight the occurrences of CHR, we see that they're mostly located towards the beginning of a function, which, which we could have guessed by looking at the proportion of the word CHR, which is very small compared to the other ones. Right, so we see that the first part of the function seems to be concerned about reading from CHR, um, and we see that the function, that the beginning of the function starts talking about uh, position, right? And position seems to be connected with CHR. So we start having a hypothesis about the structure of the function. That function starts with CHR, find out some positions, insertions, whatever that means. Um, from CHR and fills those positions and insertions. Right. Now, let's um, filter the lines that don't contain any um, control flow words, and we get that. What we can see is that most of the control flow is located in a for loop. Right, there's a con for loop with a pretty complex uh, control flow, and above, it, it, there's just a a few ifs that look like error cases, like equal n, which means we haven't find them. So the bulk of the function seems to be in the for loop. Going back to the whole function, um, we can recognize um, that for loop here. So all this code seems to be the main logic. The, the first part seems to be reading from CHR, and at the end, we fill positions. Right. Knowing that, we're going to apply the last technique, which is scanning for the main action. So for every line, we're going to decide, is that given line part of the main action or not? Is it, does it carry meaning, or is it just some technical uh, code that's necessary for the code to compile, but we don't really care about? And we're going to do that all together. Up. Right. Okay, so raise your hands if you think that this line is part of the main action. Right, no one's hands rising. How about this line? I'm going to say one. That line? That line? Yeah, it looks like an error case. This line? That line, error A I I. No. That one? That one? D did you guys get the game? <laughs> okay, moving on. This one. This one. This one. Yeah, a few hands raising. Let, let's, let's keep it. Let's say it's the main action. We'll go back to it afterwards. This one, this one, this one. I have no idea what small, Sam small indel BB threshold means. It's probably, in all likelihood, not the main action. That one, yeah, I have a few hands, let's keep it. That one, that one. That one. Um, this one. This one. This one. Yeah, a few hands. This one with the F. That one. Yeah, let's keep that. Sorry. Oops. This one. Okay. Uh, 
Um, this one, push back. Yeah, everyone's raising their hands. There's that one. OK. Sorry. This one. OK. And this one. OK. Right. Let's see. Um, before looking at the codes, let's observe the proportion of orange lines um, compared to, to not orange lines. This, is, this was just a guess, right? But we can see that most of the codes, it's not 90%, but in this case it's, I don't know, like 50, 60%, is probably not the main action. I don't know if we, we, did, we don't know if we got everything right, but it's probably near the truth. That was to illustrate the point. Now, for our intellectual satisfaction, um, what is this function doing? So uh, the project that this function comes from is uh, something about uh, genetics. And I'm assuming that CHR is a chromosome. And insertion, uh, sorry, um, yeah, the, the name of the function is process alignments. Um, and alignments, as far as I understand, is when you put several chromosomes coming from several species and you compare where they uh, are the same and where they differ so that you see what's different between the, the DNA between species. Um, now, for each chromosome, we um, try and, and, and fill the positions where those differences occur. So that's what this function is doing, essentially. Right, um, that um, closes off the second part about uh, speed reading. So start reading from the end, count the frequent words, filter and control flow, and scan for the main action. That brings us to the last part, understanding code in details. Now, we don't need to do that in many cases, but in some cases, if you want to actually change the code, for example, then, then yeah, you need to understand everything in it. Now, um, we're going to see three techniques to understand the, the minute details in code. Um, the first one is, is by doing refactoring, by changing the codes to understand it better. And not, not just any refactoring, but refactoring that decouples the code. Let's see an example. Let's say we have this class, which is called order. Um, it, it's, it's, it's massive. It's been sitting in the code base for 15 years, scaring generations of developers in your team. Right? Replace order with the name of the object in your code base. Uh, and uh, no one understands it completely. And we need to do something with order. There's one bit we're most concerned with. It's process taxes, right? Order has a process method, whatever that means. And inside process, that's process taxes. So we understand that it has something to do with taxes, but not sure exactly what. We, we're going to find out what exactly process taxes is doing in the order class. So this is the code of process taxes. It's intentionally short that it fits on the slide and we can work on it. <clears throat> but it can be as, as big as you want in theory. And below is just a reminder of order, and in particular, the, the members of order that Process Taxes uses. So Process Taxes uses some of the members of order, price, total price, origin country, and destination country. One thing that's a bit um, mysterious is what does total price mean? And how is it different from price? It's really annoying. And we see that total prices is used in order. So we're going to change the codes and decouple order, uh, sorry, we, yeah, we're going to decouple process taxes from order. We're going to pull out the code of order from the class. To do that, we are going to transform the member function into a frame function taking an order as a parameter. 
So we need to introduce some getters and setters to access the members, the data members. Now, I'm absolutely not saying that um, every member should have a getter and a setter, uh, but for the sake of this refactoring, let's, let's introduce some temporary ones. The point of doing that is um, to see what's the input and the output of the function, right? And by, um, by putting out the method into a free function, the compiler is going to help us locate every, um, every occurrence of, of calling a member in, in the code. Now, by doing that, we can identify the getters and the setters used in order, which gives us the inputs and the outputs of that function. So in this particular case, the inputs are price, origin country, destination country, and total price. And the output is total price. Good. Let's reflect that in the interface. In the interface, um, we're going to put those inputs as parameters and the output as a return value. Now, if we look at how total price is used in this function, you'll note that it's, it's, um, it's not really an input. Because when you look at how it's used over here, total price equals something. It's, it's more like the code was using a data member as an intermediary variable. So it's not really an input, it's just an output. So let's reflect that in the prototype. Now, we see that this function takes in price, origin country, and destination country, and returns a total price, and it has to do something with taxes, right? So the total price is, in fact, the price after taxes. And we can rename the function process taxes with this new knowledge, give it, give it a better name, price after taxes. And we can also re rename total price to give it a more expressive name, which is price after taxes. Right, um, now, should we keep that code? Did we, did we run the test? Did that pass the test? Uh, I don't know. We haven't, haven't talked about that. So perhaps we're just going to throw it away. Perhaps we're going to go all the way and run the test and make sure the tests are green and that the coverage is correct and, and send that into the, into, and commit that. But if we, even if we throw it away and keep the naming, we've already improved the code and improved our, our understanding of that code. So that's how refactoring um, to decouple components in a code can, can help and better understand it. Now, let's focus at what the code tells you. There are some conventions in, in the code, in C++ in particular, um, that can tell you something if you can read them. For example, in prototype. For example, if you see that kind of prototype, what does that tell you about value? Yeah, function will or may modify it. Good. Now, what about that one? What does it tell? The function is going to swallow value. How about that one? Yeah, it's, it's read-only. Value is an input. How about... You need to know that, right? That one. I think I heard. Yeah, I think I heard it. So it can be copied or sunk, depending on whether we pass an L value or an R value. But that's what the prototype is, is saying. How about that one? Yeah, it's optional. <laughs> I'll say it differently. The function can work without a value. Um, how about this one? Yeah. May or may not return a value. This one. Optional.
Yeah, I, I don't want to start a riot here. So, so all we can say is it's like ref, right? Except it's a pointer, so it can be null, but it's like ref, so it can be modified. That one? Yes. The object is swallowed. Its ownership is transferred into F. That one. Yeah, it's going to be shared, but if you have to use shared pointer, it means that you couldn't use unique or you couldn't use the stack. So there's something going on with memory. So th this is a, a warning sign. Not, not that it's going to be bad or wrong, but it's complicated, right? Because there's a simpler way to do that in C++. So if the code didn't choose to do that, there must be a reason that's complicated. That one. Yeah, it's just wrong. <laughs> and that one? doesn't mean anything, as far as I understand. It's just dangerous. It's a lot of, lot of the risk, a lot of the risk of life. Right, so that was the convention of prototype. So when you see a prototype, it tells you something, right? So, so you should pay close attention and, and read the signals. Now, there are signals in other, other places, like standard type, for example. Now, if you see that in code, what is most likely happening Yes, fine, probably, but, but to do what? Yeah, yeah, exactly, detection idiom. Just to check if a value is compilable. No, sorry, an expression is compilable. Um, if you see a set, and specifically not a vector, because vector is the by default container, what does that mean? Yeah, unique, and? Yeah, and sorted. Exactly. If you see that, and not just a stood map, it tells you about something that matters in that code. It's speed when looking up. That's what matters in that code if, if the person who wrote it chose to use um, an old map. And that one? Yeah, oh dear, exactly. <laughs> Good. Now, are these signals always, can you always trust them? Yeah, good answer, no. <laughs> so so what, what, what do you do? What, what do you do when, when, when you see a signal and you're not sure if you should trust it or not? Well, it's, it's not a simple question. Um, it's a question that's been tackled already. That's, that could be the topic of an entire talk. It actually was. Um, I can refer to um, this talk by Kay Gregory. And essentially, one way to do that is to look around to see can the signals can be trusted in general. Like, for example, if you see a reference that's not const, and and references are const everywhere, that means something about that particular reference, for example. Yeah, there are plenty, plenty more in that, in that talk, which was um, given on ACCU and was my favorite of ACCU this year, so I recommend it. But some signals are true, <laughs> uh, and, and, and you need to know what they're supposed to mean to decipher them. Okay, now uh, let's finish with the last technique, which is not about code, but about people, teaming up with people. Um, so there's a practice which is uh, quite widespread now. It's pair programming, right? Sitting at a computer, two people sitting at a computer and writing a program together. I'm agreeing, I'm arguing that we can also do pair understanding, as in two people sitting at a computer and understanding a piece of code. Now, there are plenty of ways to do that. It depends on how you like to work and how the people you're going to 
work with likes to work. So it's the square of the number of people you can, that can work together. Um, that's the number of the possibilities to do pair understanding. But, but um, essentially, why would you like to spend time with another person to, um, to understand code? Because after, uh, after all, you're going to use their time as well. Um, that can help both of you understand the code um, more quickly than just two people separately. Uh, first, the, new, the, the other person will have a fresh set of eyes on your code. And after a long time looking at the, state, the same code, um, we start having diminishing returns. So bringing someone new mechanically uh, brings higher returns in understanding. And you know this technique which is called rubber ducking, which insists in explaining what you've already understood to a rubber duck, right? And, and the very fact of articulating your understanding helps you understand more. So here we're talking about humaning, explaining what you've understood to another human. And that works pretty well, at least as well as a rubber duck. Um, perhaps that person will have known that code or known that pattern or recognize some things, know something you don't know. So you make a pool of, of the common knowledge, which uh, makes a small tool to understand that code. And, and when, you some, when you're with somebody, you just uh, kind of stay focused. Just uh, simple as that. Right, um, so that uh, wraps up the third part about um, looking at code from very close uh, by refactoring it and potentially keeping or, or throwing away the refactoring. Knowing the convention and running the signals and teaming up pair understanding with other people. So if we sum it all up, the 10 techniques we've seen, seen today are knowing your IO frameworks, finding a stronghold or several strongholds, analyzing core stacks, start reading from the end, count frequent words, filter on control flow, scan for the main action, decouple the code, read the convention, and team up with other people. This is about understanding existing, existing code. This works very well with legacy code. If you'd like to know more about tricks and tips to work with legacy code, um, you can check out this book, which is available at CPPCon. I will do a book signing tomorrow at lunchtime. Um, so it's about working with legacy code and being happy about it. Thank you very much.